Good morning. Welcome to the CRS 18 What's On Board briefing. SpaceX is getting ready to launch Dragon on a Falcon 9 rocket from Launch Complex 40 at Cape Canaveral Air Force Station. This is SpaceX's 18th contracted resupply mission for NASA. On board, about 5,000 pounds of cargo headed to the International Space Station. The Dragon spacecraft is filled with supplies for our astronauts, as well as payloads including critical materials that will support dozens of the more than 250 ongoing science projects and investigations that will be conducted during Expedition 60 and beyond. We're going to hear about some of those experiments today. Some of them have a direct impact on people's lives here on Earth. Others support NASA's Moon to Mars exploration plans. As we hear from each of our speakers, we'll open the floor to questions. Members of the media are invited to use our phone bridge to ask a question. And anyone can submit a question via Twitter using the hashtag AskNASA. Let's get started with an overview of CRS-18. Please welcome Pete Hasbrook, manager of the International Space Station Program Science Office from Johnson Space Center. Good. That's really nice. That's not how these things usually go. Thank you very much. It's great to see the excitement here. It really is. Uh, thank you very much for you being here today. Thanks to everybody who's tuned in on NASA TV. We're really excited to be here and, and really excited to bring several of our speakers here to talk about the science specifically that's going up on this Dragon mission. Dragon is really important to us. SpaceX is really important to us in the International Space Station, the multidisciplinary laboratory. Dragon brings science up to the station. It's supporting science that's already going on on the station and almost most importantly brings science samples home which is really important to our scientists to be able to bring the samples home and analyze them and bring our hardware home and refurbish it. The SpaceX Dragon is going to bring experiments that will support either new investigations or those that are already ongoing on station up about 40 or so by my quick estimate. We'd like to kick off today with a little short video about some of the science that you're going to see. So if I could cue up the PSO video, please, Program Science Office. I've got a couple other uh, highlights to give to you before we turn it over to Ken and then to the researchers. One of the uh, speakers that you'll hear this morning is going to talk about the International Docking Adapter. I won't talk about the system, but the IDA is very important to us for the space station program. It's not really research, but it's going to allow us to continue our crew rotations and other missions. We're looking for forward very much to returning to launching American spacecraft from American soil with American astronauts. The next thing I'd like to talk about, uh, you may know that we last week and this week, we had a very significant anniversary in our country and for our agency, the 50th anniversary of the Apollo landing on the moon. 
Um, we are continuing that in exploration. Um, the ISS is a big supporter of exploration development, especially with the Artemis program, where we're going to return astronauts to the moon by 2024. The ISS supports exploration development in a couple of ways, uh, primarily in human research and technology demonstration and development. On the human research side, we need to understand the risks to the human person, the human body, during long duration space flight and in confined environments. We've been studying the effects on humans for a long time, and as we understand those risks, we get to the point where we have countermeasures for them and we can mitigate those risks. And the other area is technology demonstration and development, where we allow system designers, spacecraft system operators, to design their hardware and send it to the ISS when it's not full finished yet to test it out on the ISS various modes nominal and contingency test out your logistics chain bring it home if you need to fix it eventually but it lets designers raise the technology readiness level of their their systems and decide even which system to pick as they're designing their overall spacecraft the next highlight that we have uh, you may have heard that ISS is open for commercial business kind of exciting for us and kind of trepidating for some of us who have done this for a long time um, the ISS multidisciplinary laboratory has traditionally been focused on research and return to scientists and return to benefits of that research on the ground. But there is a great interest in commercial use of space station and commercial use of space in general. So we have gone through some big steps to set up a policy for using the ISS for commercial purposes. That includes how our NASA astronauts can be involved, what is the pricing, how much allocation. There is, uh, there is a opportunity for destinations in low Earth orbit for a module to be attached to ISS as well as free flying modules. We're working on the private astronaut missions, which will bring private astronauts using commercial vehicles up to the ISS. We're developing the demand for low Earth orbit economy. We're looking for ideas and we're funding ideas for manufacturing in space, for new facilities, for laboratory development. Um, and finally, we are looking at ourselves, at NASA's long-term needs for low Earth orbit. What NASA is always going to need low Earth orbit to train our astronauts, to develop our, to do our own fundamental research, but NASA doesn't want to be the landlord, the the funder forever. We want to use the commercial market as we are the client instead of the the provider, if you will. Uh, the website for that, with much more information, is nasa.gov. LEO dash economy, low earth orbit economy. There's a lot of uh, the policy is there, the opportunities are there, and maybe most importantly, the frequently asked questions and the contact information for more. We also, I'm going to wrap it up here with some of the resources for you to find out more about the research that we do in the science and technology. First off, our program science office maintains a database of all the experiments and the facilities that we have on ISS, historical and even future, as well as the scientific results publications that we can find. You can find all that on our web pages on nasa.gov slash iss dash science. We also have uh, just released, the inter through the International Partnership, the Benefits for Humanity 3rd Edition. It's a major publication for us. It talks about the benefits of all the research that we do and how it benefits those of us here on Earth. The 3rd Edition is out there on nasa.gov slash station benefits. You can get an electronic book version. You can get stories. The stories are written for those of us who don't understand science and don't understand the technology. Written in everyday language, there are also videos to to support that. And finally, we have an app for that. We have a condensed version of our science toolbox that you can download to your phone, whether it's an iPhone or an Android device. It's called the Space Station Research Explorer, SSRX for Explorer. It's a condensed version of our database, uh, puts it all right there in front of you on the phone. And if you're looking things up, I use it all the time as I'm traveling. So with that, we'll wrap it up and move on to the other speakers, but we will take questions here if there are any, right? Okay, if anyone has a question, just wait for the microphone to reach you. Anyone? Sir, right here in the front, we'll get the microphone to you. Just a moment. Thanks, thanks for taking the question. Thanks for doing this and for being here. Um, I guess looking at the video and all the like healthcare applications that are being considered by the International Space Station and going up there, has there ever been any talk about a second or multiple International Space Station, especially when you talk about the commercial use? That is the market that we want to develop, the commercial market. Um, one of the opportunities for commercial is to 
attach a module to the space station, which could become the core of a future separate space station. There's a lot of interest out there as far as flying, developing and flying individual separate stations. Okay, anyone else? I have a question for them all, Pete. Oh, How oh. many people here want to be a space tourist? Okay, <laughs> so there's a few. So that commercial activity, are we talking hotel yet? Uh, that is a possibility out there. People have ideas of building a separate hotel. Uh, coming to the station w with a private astronaut mission um, could be to do whatever that private entity wants to do. If you want to film a commercial, if you want to fly medallions, it's things that we traditionally don't do, haven't done on the ISS because it's not really research focused. But we will support it now. A certain like 5% of our NASA allocation is available for the time, for the upmass, for storage, things like that. All right, that's something I think a lot of us could get excited about. Thank you very Let's much. Let's thank oh, wait, we have another wait, question wait, here wait. over here. Hello, thanks again for being here. We're all excited. One question I received on Twitter for Ask NASCA, have we found any signs of life recently in space? Other than our astronauts? No. <laughs> no, we haven't. Nothing that we haven't brought with us. Okay, we have another question here up front. Hi, thank you so much. We're really excited to be here today. My name is Denise Wright. I'm a science educator. Um, my question is, do you have any student projects on board? Um, can you tell me about any of those types of student projects or how does a student go about possibly getting a project on board to have you know, their scientific experiment done on the ISS? Thanks. Good question. I'm glad for what you do too. Um, actually, I'm going to have you asked the question again when Ken Shields is up here because the National Lab sponsors the education. But definitely we have opportunities. A lot is going on on station for education. Um, we just had a year long sort of a mission with two educators on board. Uh, there are resources out there on nasa.gov slash stem on station. Uh, Ken will probably give you a couple other resources out there. Um, I also have a couple of copies, you'll see them in the room, of our Expedition 60 I'll call it a synopsis, and it's really for educators. On the back page of it is a whole list of resources for educators. Okay. Let's thank Pete one more time. All right. You're spoiling me. Thank you. Okay. So we already had a few hints of what's coming up next. And so I hear that some of the science going up might just set a research record. So to help tell us more and to give us a few more education hints is Ken Shields, Vice President and Chief Operating Officer of the U.S. National Laboratory on Station. Thank you, Laura. And space tourism does sound like a lot of fun, so sign me up for that as well. Uh, but yes, breaking records. Uh, business is, is booming on the ISS and, and the National Lab in particular. Um, with this mission, with SpaceX 18, we're launching 25 payloads to the ISS. Of those 25, about 70% are from the private sector. With, with this complement of payloads, we will set new records for crew time usage, crew time utilization, uh, not only for this current increment pair, which is a six-month uh, interval in time on space station, but for the entire year, we're also going to set new records for crew time usage and crew time utilization of what our allotment is. We're seeing a lot of positive trends as it relates to uh, R&D and industry and, and really the research community in general. It's not just private sector and industry. We have some initiatives that are focused to driving and fostering that um, investment and use of space station, but we also have some fantastic basic and fundamental research on station that we support. Uh, basic and fundamental research will always have a home uh, with the ISS National Laboratory um, as long as it's bringing about a benefit to humankind. That's, that's really uh, the objective of our mission. So tomorrow's uh, launch, once again, 25 payloads. I'd like to uh, show a video now that'll give you some details on many of the payloads that we're flying, and then we'll follow up afterwards. Investigations sponsored by the International Space Station U.S. National Laboratory are primed for launch on SpaceX's 18th Commercial Resupply Services Mission to Orbiting Laboratory. When we say that this launch is packed with research, we mean it. This launch has more payloads than we have ever sent on a single mission. Private sector companies, academic researchers, STEM projects, life and physical sciences, all on this mission. So let's get an idea about some of the payloads that are launching on SpaceX CRS-18. The Goodyear Tire and Rubber Company is sending what they hope is the first of many investigations to the ISS National Lab. This initial experiment will evaluate the formation of silica particles in microgravity. 
Silica is a common material used in consumer tires. However, silica and rubber are materials that don't easily bond. Can the microgravity environment of the space station allow Goodyear to find silica morphologies not possible on Earth? If so, this could lead to improvements in fuel efficiency and other performance factors in consumer tires. The space station is an ever-evolving research platform, and NASA and the ISS National Lab are constantly sponsoring new facilities on the orbiting laboratory to increase the capacity for innovative research. This launch, America's first automated bioprinter for use in space, will make its way to station. Developed by TechShot, this bioprinter will initially seek to print cardiac-like tissue. The printed tissues will remain on station until they are strong enough for the return trip to be analyzed on Earth. While the ability to manufacture human organs is likely many years away, this bioprinter could lead to unique methods of industrial biomedicine and microgravity to develop materials for patient care on Earth. Part of the role of the ISS National Lab is to inspire and educate the next generation. And what better way to do that than by forming fun and exciting collaborations with unique partners? Not many young students understand the term non-Newtonian fluidics in a microgravity environment. However, just about every young student is familiar with Nickelodeon and its iconic slime. So on this mission, Nickelodeon Slime in Space will make its way to station for a variety of demonstrations to educate students on the basic concepts of fluid flow and microgravity paired with normal gravity conditions on Earth. So there you have it. Advanced materials, industrial biomedicine, education payloads, new facilities, and repeat flight partners. This mission represents the demand that continues to build as more researchers and companies recognize the unique potential for sustained R&D in microgravity. To learn more about all ISS National Lab sponsored payloads on this mission and how to become part of the space station research community, visit ISSNationalLab.org. So as you can see, this launch, this particular mission, SpaceX 18, I just think is, is a great representation of the trends that we're seeing. Once again, diversity of applications that we can use space and microgravity and specifically the ISS for. Diversity of the types of organizations and the types of people uh, that we work with. Uh, the construct of this national lab really provides uh, open access to really most any person or company or organization that has a great idea that can somehow leverage the use of space, microgravity, space station facilities, space station resources to benefit humankind here on Earth. Uh, you heard uh, Pete talk a little bit about NASA's new uh, LEO economic development efforts and what they're doing with some of their resources to try and support commerce, really for the sake of commerce. It's not research and development necessarily. It might be, but it doesn't have to be to go through that pathway. We don't necessarily play in that space. That's not what National Lab's remit or purview is. However, we've got a, a significant number of payloads and projects in our pipeline that move from basic and fundamental to applied research and development. And now perhaps this new pathway on Space Station allows us an opportunity to finish that continuum and move from applied R&D into a real commercial application. We hope by doing this, we're driving the industrialization of space. We want to drive, drive this industrial ecosystem, this market economy that we're, we're working towards in space. It's, it's really uh, early stage right now, but there are some tremendous signs that uh, it's going to be a, a very robust economy in the future. We've seen it in, in the communication industry, right? We've got companies who are flying satellites, but now we see companies in industry doing all types of things uh, in, on space. and. And Space Station, particularly National Lab, is a great place to start that activity, foster that activity, incubate it. So my view of Space Station right now, we've got this awesome part research laboratory, part business incubator, part business park, it's in space. And guess what? Access is open. We can get there five, six times a year at least. We're coming back from Space Station three, four times a year. It's maybe not as challenging as, as it sounds. So I would encourage anyone out there who's got some great ideas uh, to go and do some R&D in space, get, get in touch with the National Lab and let's, let us see how we can help you. Uh, last, uh, it's not all about very, very serious grown-up science, right? 99.9% .9 of what we do is exactly that. But you saw it's also very important for us to excite, engage, and motivate the next generation of technologists, the next generation of engineers, the next generation of scientists. So we had a question about STEM education. That's also a, a focus area for, for us. And you saw we've got a very uh, unique partnership with Nickelodeon where we're going to 
try to slime some stuff in space and see what happens, compare it to what happens on the ground. These are interesting sort of mechanical fluid, fluid physics uh, demonstrations that we're going to do. We've got some other great partners uh, that we work with as well, including Quest and Magnitude IO, and there's a lot of free resources you can find at our website, issnationallab.org, and also spacestationexplorers.org. Uh, I would encourage everyone who's interested in education to take advantage of those things. I've got a special treat. I, I, I wanted to bring some show and tell. I couldn't bring live cell cultures. I couldn't bring rodents. I couldn't bring a lot of the stuff, and I had nothing like this bioprinting thing that these tech shot guys would bring, but I've got some pretty cool stuff here. I've got a a bag of Nickelodeon slime that we're going to be flying to station. So afterwards, if anybody would like to have some interaction with the slime or get slimed, no, I can't slime anyone. <laughs> um, but I know you guys, uh, this is the social media crew, so you can certainly uh, blow up the Twitter sphere, Twitter sphere and uh, have some really cool Snapchat stories with this afterwards if you'd like to. Uh, that's all I have. If anyone has any questions that we have time, I'd be glad to take them. Yes. I believe, oh, we've got lots of questions. We'll start here in the front, and then we'll go to the second row over here. Uh, my first question has to do with the slime. So what do you think this is actually going to do in outer space? Like your, your best scientific prediction. My best scientific prediction, well, I suspect uh, if they try to slime an astronaut, it's not going to work like it would on Earth, but I'm not sure exactly what, I, what it will do. I don't know if when we try to splatter it, if it will splatter like it does on Earth. I'm not sure if it will uh, puddle or uh, move about. We don't know. That's why we go and do these things. Uh, and we're going to compare it to uh, ground-based work, and then we're going to have some curriculum out there for uh, young folks to work with and try to explain and understand and answer those questions. Are there differences? Why are there differences? Perfect. And can you say space slime three times fast? <laughs> space slime, space slime, space slime. <laughs> yeah, that was perfect. Uh, all right. I think we had another question in the second row. Thank you. Um, will there be a live feed for students to follow along with any of these experiments, or how will they be able to keep track? There will not be a live feed with uh, slime. There are some uh, live feeds with some of the other uh, projects that we work with. Um, Zero Robotics is one for coding. Twice a year, there's a live feed uh, from uh, orbit of the uh, astronauts working on uh, uh, controlling these robots that we have called spheres. Uh, kids program them, they move around. That's a live feed. Most of the other uh, STEM projects that we have are, are data, data fed over time, not live feeds. Okay, any other questions this side of the room? All right, Ken, I think space slime is very exciting stuff. Thank you so Thank much. Thank you. Go NASA, go Dragon, go ISS National Lab. Thank you. Okay. Well, I want to take it back to some of the serious science that we have on board. Today, more than 110,000 people in the U.S. alone have their name on a list for an organ transplant. In the meantime, researchers are working with 3D bioprinters in an effort to manufacture human organs. But they're meeting with some challenges. What if we take gravity out of the process? To tell us more about the biofabrication facility, welcome Dr. Gene Bolin, Chief Scientist of TechShot, Inc., and Dr. Ken Church, CEO of Enscript. Great. Thank you so much. Um, Thank you. We are, we are so excited to be here. This is, you guys are a great crowd, by the way, and so you are nuts. And so uh, we appreciate so much. We want to talk to you about, I really want to talk to you about my BFF. Excuse me, Gene. Yeah. <laughs> no problem, Ken. This, is, this becomes really important, and BFF stands for exactly what you might think, biofabrication facility. And so we're going to take our BFF and put it in space, and it becomes really important because we do have some obstacles. And I want Gene to talk about that just a little bit. Yeah, so yeah, we opened it up with uh, kind of a serious note. More than 100,000 people on a waiting list right now for an organ transplant. And unfortunately, that's usually a one-to-one -one process. You get an organ when somebody else loses an organ. So... What if we break that? What if we break that linkage? What if one day you can print your own organ, maybe from your own cells? What if one day 22 people a day don't have to die because they're on that waiting list because we don't have enough transplants? We've heard a lot this week about small steps and giant leaps. BFF is one of those. We think we can revolutionize the tissue printing field. We think we can revolutionize what's going to happen in regenerative medicine. So what we're going to see coming back from printing, no, we're not bringing heart back with us. We're not bringing organ back with us. But what we think we're going to do is we're really going to revolutionize what we can do in bioprinting. 
So what we've actually done here is we're going to take everything that's not biology out of bioprinting. So bioprinting is like any other 3D printing that you've ever seen before, where you put an ink in. In this case, it's cells, it's all the nutrients, it's everything else the cells need to stay alive, but that's it. We're taking all the structure out of it. And by going to microgravity, we don't have to have any structure. The cells and the fluid and the soft gels, think of it as pancake batter, like we always used to say. But when is a pancake a pancake? And I'll hand this off to Ken, because Ken loves the pancake so story. It, you know, I, I understand some people love Nickelodeon and those things, but see, we're much more sophisticated than that. We like to talk real science with pancakes. And that is the real question. I think the question is, when is a pancake a pancake? Is it after you've made the batter, or is it maybe after you cooked it? And so what is a little bit different about us, not just that we do precision printing, and we do precision printing. I'll just be up with you on that. That's what that is. I have to throw it out there. That's why I get paid. But it gets back to this. It's also, it only happens when you finish the process. You must mature the cells. You must mature the entire process. And this is what is unique about us. We put that combination together so it's all in one. So we're not just printing goo, but it's going to become something special. If we could roll the clip. We'll start that, and we'll let Gene start to talk through that clip just a little bit, because I think it's really important to understand uh, the process of what we really put together. Not just a printer, but also the incubation the uh, whole aspect of the, the cell culture and where that's going. Right, so, so when we talk about printing for the sake of biology, so we're printing everything, but if we print all of it and we bring it right back down, we're just gonna get pancake batter when we get back down to the ground because you know SpaceX has a great launch and return vehicle. Unfortunately, it's not really a soft return vehicle. So we'll, we'll get that pancake back with our bioprinted. So what we have to do is what we're seeing there in the corner is we have to incubate it for a while afterwards. So. What we're gonna do is we're gonna take that printed material and then we're gonna put it in and we're gonna condition it. So we're gonna condition it the way that you know everything is already conditioned. So it's gonna be chemically, it's gonna be mechanically, and it's gonna be electrically conditioned because that's the way all of us were conditioned. And those signals will turn a bioprinted construct into a tissue. And that's where we like to draw the line because what comes out of a bioprinter isn't a tissue. It never will be a tissue. It'll only be a construct because we're just putting building blocks down and then we're hopefully gonna be putting those materials down and then can step back and let biology do what biology does. As smart as we think we are, biology will always be smarter. So we just wanna step back and let biology take over. And that's what our bioreactor is gonna do. It's gonna put those cues in where and when they're needed and for long enough that we can bring those tissues back. And then we're gonna see what happens. Our goal is, is that we're gonna print a tissue that's more than a centimeter thick. And you think a centimeter, that's not really that impressive. Well, that's more than 10 times what we can print on the ground. And we think that microgravity is gonna be the key in building this without having to put external structure in there is the key. And we think that both we're gonna learn things that in space that we can bring back to ground, but I think there's gonna be some things that will always be printed in space. And that's where the, we're so excited about this whole low earth orbit economy and being able to move things forward, both with NASA and with CASIS and with ISS National Lab, great partners to help really expand this low earth orbit economy. So I'd go back and I'd sort of see it this way. If we think about what a great bioreactor is, if you're trying to understand what that might be, you have a really great example. Well, you are the really great example of what a bioreactor is. Well, half of you. <laughs> half of you are an incredible bioreactor. The rest of you, if I put something in you, it's gonna grow. You might not like that. But for those of you who are able to have babies, make babies, one of the things that will happen is, I call that God's bioreactor. And so as this thing starts to grow, I want you to think about what happens to that, that infant as that infant is growing. Uh, one, it's suspended. And so instead of a hard Petri dish, it is suspended in, in certain conditions. So can we mimic those certain conditions? And this is the other advantage that we think we might have moving up into space. Many advantages in that. So move that whole condition, get it, get it up in space, release that, that tissue, I guess you might say, as it starts growing. You know, Gene's a little modest. She says we're bringing back tissue. We're not just bringing back tissue. We're bringing back tissue that's cardiac tissue, and it's going to beat. And so that's what's really cool. It's, yeah, it's going to look like a little piece of steak. That sounds gross. Don't eat it. <laughs> but it's going to beat just like a heart. That is cool as anything. So what happens if we build the next thing and the next thing and the next thing? Eventually, yeah, we're going to print a heart. That's really where we're going. We're not going to just print the heart, but we're going to have to do the entire process. So we are certainly jazzed up about where this is going. Um, and I like it, as they said, so th since they're promoting the commercial aspect, uh, yeah, it's open for business. And so if you are saying, I am a 
boy, if you're a high school student and you're doing this, you're crazy. That's awesome. But if you're a university and you say, look, I'm doing some tissue engineering experiments and I want to do on the space station, uh, welcome to your BFF. Uh, this is truly going to be your BFF as this thing starts pushing forward. So we are excited about uh, the opportunities uh, that this is going to bring for those of you who have a personal reason to do that. Uh, many of us have that. Um, there's a reason. Just like anything, you know, maybe it's a small step forward, in this case, a small tissue forward, but a giant leap for mankind. This is going to be a giant organ one day with this small tissue. We are planning on absolutely. Somebody said, when will you grow a heart? You know, for those of you who are young, well, first off, I hate you. Um, <clears throat> but you're really at a great time. Let's just, let's just say that because, um, you know, when you have that chance and you come back and you can capture your cells, and you can, for those of you who are going to have children and the doctor offers you to capture your cells, childs, and freeze those, uh, do that. Because you have an opportunity that one day, if by chance something goes wrong, we could take your cells, put those together, bioprint those in a very specific shape, Send it up, you know, while it's up there, grow part of that, bring that back down to you, and do something very magical. So this is, this is an exciting step for us. We are obviously very proud of what we're doing. And so the partnership that we've had, my BFF, sure, Gene can have my BFF. It's okay. We'll give it to him. So we're excited, we're excited to work together, but we're also excited to work with you. All right. Thank you. Does anyone have questions? Oh, okay. So we got several on this side of the room. We'll start up front. Hi, good morning. Thank you for having us. My name is uh, David Cohen. Uh, good to be here with you today. My question is, how did you settle on, on cardiac tissue as opposed to some other uh, muscle tissue or uh, tissue from some other organ, uh, or you know, be, it, be, it, uh, be it skin, be it nerve, be it you know, liver, kidney, lungs, whatever it might be? What, what was it about cardiac tissue that was so appealing? So two things, actually, with cardiac tissue. One, actually, the heart is a fairly simple pump. And two, most of my team has a cardiovascular background. So it's, it's what we knew the most about. It's what we've tried for the longest. And so it was a natural progression for us. But like we said, BFF is open for business. And uh, there's nothing specific about heart uh, with, the, uh, with the equipment. It's just what we knew best. And so we figured it was our best shot for success. I would say this. It really is important. And this is where the success is really going to happen when it spreads out amongst other specialists. When you start looking at heart specialists and these guys who know that kind of process, it's very specialized, and that becomes really important. You can make a lot of mistakes easily. He talks about once we get it going and then God takes over and does what it's supposed to do, it's smarter than us. We still have to get it so far. Uh, I'm really an engineer by background, which means uh, we kill things. And uh, the biologists, they keep them alive, but it's really challenging to do that if you don't know where you're at. So the specialist becomes very important. Okay, gentlemen, I think we have an Ask NASA social question over here in the front row. Twitter question from user James Rowland. James says, these experiments seem to be heavily geared towards biology and medical. What can we do to prepare our bodies for long-term space travel? And also, are we close to being ready for long-term space travel and long-term living aboard the International Space Station? So, I mean, these are really fun questions to start pondering, but I would look at it this way. I mean, we start talking about long-term. One of the, the goals that we have is to make sure that we have a printer up there so if something does go bad, let's just imagine you go to Mars and you need something, you don't have a lot of access. So from our perspective, we do want to be able to get to the point where we can put things together. Uh, it's not just about growing organs. We can also make medical devices. We can make uh, specialized bandages. We can make biologics and print biologics. So all of that together. So how do we prepare ourselves? Well, one, I think we're going to go out and explore, number one. But two, being prepared. Be a Boy Scout, I guess you say. Always be prepared. This is really what BFS is trying to do for us, is get us that point. So if we get ourselves in trouble, maybe we can grow something to us, help us a little bit. Yeah, and the only thing I would add is, uh, you know, stay healthy and bank early. So, uh, you know, your, uh, your cells are never as young as they, uh, as they once were. So, uh, you know, younger cells are easier to work with than old cells. And so, uh, you know, it's, uh, if, you think, if you think you are going to become an explorer, um, you know, um, a young blood sample is uh, easier to work with than an old sample. So, you know, unfortunately, uh, you know, aging, uh, aging affects all your cells. And, uh, you know, it's, uh, it's easier to work, uh, as we've found, and as most, uh, as most uh, stem cell researchers in the crowd will tell you, it's, uh, it's easier to work with a young cell than an old cell. Um, it's not impossible, but, uh, you know, bank early, and uh, it uh, may save you in the long run. Well, as they say, youth is wasted on the young. <laughs> okay, I think we had a few more questions on this side of the room. There's a gentleman on the aisle over there. Yeah, uh, just, just to clarify, you're talking about incubating and uh, um, 
conditioning, same thing. And I guess the question also is in what? In, is that what it is in? Is it the Sure. So actually, what we have here, um, it looks like a big looks like a big block, but it's actually uh, it's actually two. So we have on the left side this uh, basically dorm fridge size is where the printing takes place. The electronics module down here. So this this big L is actually the bioprinter. So this is the BFF. Uh, this top piece um, is actually a separate unit. This is where the incubation takes place. This is actually um, legacy hardware. This is our ADCEP, our advanced. Uh, space experiment processor. So, so this uh, will have three separate modules in it, uh, which will do the long-term conditioning. So we do conditioning, bioreactor. Those are all kind of interchangeable terms for us. But that's where we will put the tissue after it's printed. Um, basically, it's the maturation process. It's what turns a construct into a tissue. Okay, and I think we had one more question on this side of the aisle, near the back. If you'll just wait for the microphone, it might take us a moment. Thank you. So you said this uh, cardiac tissue is being printed in space. How do you think it'll function when it comes back to Earth when it's in the presence of gravity? Before he answers that this way, I want to try to clarify something. We don't really print tissue, and that's very important. And this is why we talk about the pancake as it goes through the full maturation process. We print cells, extracellular matrices, but very important point. Then we grow that, mature that, and we end up with tissue. And then when it comes down, not a not a, not a puddle, that will be the good news. <laughs> so the goal is we're doing a lot of, we're gonna do a lot of testing on this, uh, on the tissues that we bring back. So uh, we hope we're gonna get back to uh, close to full cardiac strength uh, when we bring it back. But um, you know, there's a, there's a lot of variables and you know, um, the short answer is um, a tissue of this size, both has never been grown and never been grown in microgravity. So um, you know, we'll, uh, Let's meet up in uh, 45 days and we'll let you know. So really, really quickly, Gene, when we start talking about the printing versus the processing, how long does it stay up there and then when does it come down? So, you know, BFF is, uh, you know, it's taking kind of a one-way trip for quite a while. Um, the first cassettes that we're printing, uh, we're bringing back on uh, SpaceX 18, so uh, sometime late August, hopefully, um, on the uh, SpaceX 18 mission. And then we're going to uh, keep them going in our lab and uh, do some both mechanical uh, chemical testing and look at the tissue to see how it compares to native tissue as well as how it compares to things that we're growing on the ground to find out, you know, do cells that grow in space, do stem cells that grow in space, do they differentiate correctly? There's been a lot of experiments with stem cells in space in the past um, that haven't behaved like stem cells do on the ground. And so we're saying, you know, can we, you know, can we force them to do what we want in our bioreactor? Do we have the recipe right? You know, it's a looks like, feels like, tastes right thing to get stem cells to do what they want to, to do what you want them to do. And we think we have the recipe right, but uh, you know, we won't know until it's back. Uh, we do have uh, feedback and sensors in our system, so we will know kind of what they're doing, but really until we get it back in our hands and uh, we start cutting, cutting and taking pictures, uh, we won't know for sure. But again, don't eat it. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Thank you, gentlemen, Thanks so, so much. very much. Thank you. Shall we get back to talking about exploration? Because when NASA goes forward to the moon and on to Mars, we're going to have to learn to use the resources that are available to us in space. But it's going to be tricky to send up heavy mining equipment to mine those resources in microgravity. What if there was something tiny that could do the job for us, or at least make it easier? To talk about BioRock, let's welcome Charles Kakel, Professor of Astrobiology at the University of Edinburgh. Thank you very much, Laura. Thank you, Laura. So carrying on now with biology, but smaller types of biology, microbes. So I'm really excited to tell you about the project BioRock. Uh, this is a project led by the University of Edinburgh in the UK with the German Space Agency and SCK uh, with our collaborators ESA and Kaiser. Now, BioRock is an experiment to study how microbes, bacteria, interact with rocks in microgravity and simulated Martian gravity. And you might think, why would we be interested in what microbes do in rocks? Well, microbes on the Earth are used to break down rocks to release economically important elements. About 60% of the world's copper and gold is today extracted in biomining. So in the long-term future exploration of the Moon and Mars, we might want to use microbes to help us break down rocks to do industry. That's a very long-term view. In the shorter-term view, microbes break down rocks and turn them into soils. 
if we want to transform uh, lunar and Martian basalt into material that is more useful for agriculture, for growing crops, rather than having to take things with us, we might use bacteria to do that. And then finally, of course, we could use extraterrestrial materials to supply nutrients in life support systems. Why ship nutrients to the moon and Mars with all that mass and energy cost when you can just shovel in some lunar and Martian regolith into your life support system and provide the nutrients uh, from that? So this experiment is the first experiment to look at how microbes grow in basalt. So let's have a look at, at four slides just to explain the detail of this experiment a little bit more. Um, the first slide we're looking at is a biofilm. This is what microbes like to do. They like to grow over the surface of rocks and into rocks. This is one of our microbes that's been stained with a DNA binding stain. It's sphingomonas. It's a desiccation resistant microbe that likes eating rocks and it's growing into those rock cavities. What effect does microgravity have and simulated Martian gravity, which is three-eighths Earth gravity, on this process of biofilm formation. We don't know, but we're going to find that out. I should also say that biofilms are very important on the Earth. They form in medical devices, they form in industrial plants, they clog up pipes. We need to understand how biofilms form in space. So quite apart from our rock interests, we're also going to learn something fundamental about biofilm formation uh, on, on, uh, the, uh, on the Earth. Oh, there's a badge disappearing. <laughs> OK, let's move on to the next slide. Uh, this is a, 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 a small slide of basalt. Uh, this is the rock that we're going to be using. It makes up the majority of the Martian crust and also uh, the lunar crust as well. It's uh, a volcanic rock. It's typical of planetary bodies. And this is the material we've chosen to look at this biofilm growth. It's a one centimeter square block of basalt. Onto the next slide. And these are six of the 18 bioreactors that we're sending into space. And incidentally, these are the world's first prototype mining reactors to be sent into space. They're quite small. I've got one right here. They are uh, two culture chambers in there. Each chamber, you'll see in the, in the photograph there, contains the small basalt slide. We send these up to ISS. The microbes are desiccated on the rocks. We inject medium into the chambers. The microbes get growing. And then for three weeks, they grow over the surface of the rock and release all those elements. And then we inject some fixative, and that stops the microbes from growing. These bioreactors then come back down to Earth. And after that, we do two major things. We look at the biofilm growth over the rocks to understand the effects of microgravity uh, on their growth and Martian gravity. And we also look at the concentration of elements in the medium, in the liquid around the microbes, to understand how efficiently they've broken down the rocks. Microgravity changes fluid flow. And without convection, it changes fluid dynamics. And it will change the way in which the biofilms grow and how efficient the elements are released from the rock. So we can get an understanding of how uh, efficiently biofilm growth occurs. And then finally, last slide, you can see here the cubic centrifuge. There are two of those on the ISS. We're going to be using both of those uh, in th over the three-week experiment. Uh, one of them will simply be used as a control, a 1G control, to simulate Earth gravity. So we have an Earth gravity control uh, in space. Uh, carried out in triplicate for all conditions. And we're going to be using one of the other cubics to simulate Martian gravity to see what happens when we add Martian uh, regolith and rocks to microbes and how they form biofilms under Martian conditions for future long-term uh, human Mars exploration. So in summary, BioRock uh, is about using microbes. Microbes are everywhere. They make your yogurt, they cause disease, and they're going to go with us into space whether we like it or not. The BioRock project is about enhancing uh, the alliance between the microbial world and our civilization in the long-term human exploration and settlement of space, and ensuring that rather than doing bad things, microbes can help us uh, establish a permanent human presence in space. Thank you. All right, thank you. Do we have any questions about BioRock? We have a gentleman here in the second row. Hi there. I'm Grant Locke. I'm really happy to be here. And so you talked about um, the agricultural implications of this. And so I just kind of wanted to ask, like, what kind of microbes are you guys looking at? And are you specifically looking at microbes that might have symbiotic relationships with crops we have here on Earth? Yeah, that's a really great question. We're looking at three microbes, uh, Sphingomonas desicarbalis, which was actually isolated in the Harvey Desert here in the U.S., and it, and it grows in, uh, in soil crust. So it's naturally a, a microbe that grows in soil. So it does have some implications. It's the sort of thing you might want to add to regolith to improve it, uh, to, to add organic material if you were going to grow plants in it. Uh, the other microbe is, is Bacillus subtilis, which is a... Uh, 
you could think of it as a space lab rat. It's flown into space many times. It's a really good microbe to, uh, to use because you can compare it to previous space data. Uh, there's been uh, experiments done on, on biofilm growth on the Earth, for instance. And then the other one is Cupriavidus metalligurans, which is a metal-resistant microbe that was isolated from a heavy metal-filled uh, toxic pool in Belgium a long, long time ago. And it's really good at, at doing biomining and eating rocks and living in heavy metal-contaminated sites. So that's a little bit more on the biomining bio side. So we've picked three organisms, and I should say that I didn't mention, one of the exciting things about this experiment is it'll be the first experiment where we've got multiple microbes in exactly the same experimental apparatus that we can compare. So the first experiment where we've got three microbes in space where we can look at microgravity effects. So these other things, as well as the applications that we'll learn uh, in this experiment. Okay, Any, anyone else? All right. Thank you, Professor. Okay, thank you. <laughs> so how many people here in the room have ever broken a bone? Okay, I see a fair number of hands, and we could be here a good long time hearing about your long road to recovery and the disruption to your daily life. But what if we could improve upon that process? Joining me now to talk about Cell Science O2 is Dr. Rasha Hamamiya, Principal Investigator from the U.S. Army, and Dr. Melissa Cassina, co-investigator from Indiana University School of Medicine. Good morning. Well, good morning, everyone. Thank you very much for being here. And uh, we're very excited to tell you about our uh, cell science uh, experiment. Um, next slide, please. So this, this effort is a collaboration between the U.S. Army Medical Command, uh, Indiana University, the DOD Space Test Program, and, and NASA. Next, please. Basically, this, is, this experiment is two parts. One of them that's already been manifested, which is the in vivo, where we send rodents and mice into space to study bone fraction, bone healing in microgravity. But what we'll, what we'll be talking about today is the um, one in vitro where cells are um, um, sent into space with the, in bioreactors uh, to study how they behave in microgravity and how they behave in response to um, uh, treatments. Uh, what we do here in the Army is we study whole genome analysis, so we study mechanisms. Uh, we process um, tens of thousands of genes and proteins to understand what happens, what, what mechanisms of what's happening in microgravity uh, to these cells. Uh, next slide, please. So thank you, Rasha. Um, as Laura started off, I saw a lot of hands in the audience, people fractured. I hope all of you healed perfectly and there were no problems long term. But what you might not know is 5 to 10% of fractures will not heal without extra help or intervention by the orthopedic surgeon. And what they use is a drug called bone morphogenetic protein, and this helps to heal the bone. It's the only FDA-approved drug that the orthopedic surgeons can use right now. So if you see that x-ray there, that's a very damaged bone. Only 50% of those will heal. So that's what uh, somebody from the Army, she's from the Army, the, they're supporting this work. Somebody from the Army in Afghanistan, a blast injury, you're going to see a damaged leg like this. If you don't have to amputate it, you'll want to reconstruct it using these bone morphogenetic proteins. However, there is a risk of developing cancer with the use of these proteins. So identifying new bone healing agents is really important. We have a recent patent on a new bone healing agent that we think will be very useful coming up into the future. And that's what we're testing here. So you may say, well, why do we need to do that in space flight? Why can't we just do it here on Earth? Animals will walk immediately after you do a bone surgery. Humans, we don't. We use crutches. We're told by the doctor, well, we shouldn't. We, we should use our crutches if the doctor tells us we should be in a wheelchair. We may be bedridden. But in space flight, the animals can't see that gravity. And bone healing is helped when you walk, when you bear weight. And the drugs that we currently have work through that mechanism. The drug we have patented does not. And so we think it will be better for bone healing in space flight if we go to Mars and have a fracture or here on Earth for the military personnel, for bad auto accidents, and even for people with osteoporosis that have a fracture and it has impaired healing. Um, next slide, please. So what are we doing? Here we're doing the cell culture mission, and these are the bone-forming cells. Next video, please. And so in the next loop, they'll show a video where these cells are migrating and proliferating to heal the wound. And so that's what we're going to be looking at here in the space flight. 
Um, next one, please. Sorry, other direction. So this is our, our team. I actually left. We're loading the space flight hardware right now. It's for um, handover later today. And Rasha will hold the bioreactor that you can see in the video that they're loading right now to prepare everything for the handover. Next video. So in the next video, we'll have a little bit more of a close-up, but the cells are contained here within the bioreactor. And the reason why I want to show you this is the reddish-pinkish solution is the media, the nutrients for the cells. And um, so in our mission, that it's mostly automated, but there are three times that the astronauts will help with our payload. So at day seven, they will help feed the cells like what's happening with the syringe here. They'll do that again at day 11. And then ours is a 14-day mission. And so then they'll do a fixative, which preserves the cells. They'll then go into the freezer to continue to preserve them until they come back here on Earth. And then um, we'll go to the next slide, please. And Dr. Hamamea will tell you uh, what we're going to do to process them after they return to the Earth. Yeah, so, so basically the cells will stay uh, on board um, um, we'll, with, we'll be They'll be feeding them, uh, as uh, Melissa had mentioned. At the end of the reaction, what's going to happen is we'll stop the cell growth the, by adding a fixative. Uh, the cells will come in, um, um, coming back to the Earth. And in, uh, on Earth, what we're going to do is process these samples. So what we do is um, so, uh, isolate RNA and DNA and proteins from these cells and do a whole genome analysis, whole proteome and whole metabolome analysis. And this will help us understand the whole picture, look at mechanisms of what happens. We'll see some genes that will be up or down regulated, and these genes have functions. So this will tell us what's happening in response to microgravity as well as what happens in response to these drugs in microgravity. Next, please. So this, this, video, this video here is showing the bioculture where the bioreactors will be residing. And this has two compartments. One of them is a warm compartment at 37 degrees. That's where the cells will grow in. And then the second compartment next to it is a cold compartment. And that's where all the nutrients and the media will be in. And what happens is the crew member will inject the media at certain time points to feed these cells uh, and then add the fixative at the end. And again, we'll get the cells here, process, and do the RNA and DNA isolation as well as protein. I think that's uh, pretty There's, much it. I think one final slide. Oh, that's it. So this is the workflow, actually, of what happens. We, we start with the bioculture, bio get the bioreactors, cut the bioreactors, and get the cells out of these uh, bioreactors to process these cells um, and to do the, some microarrays, some whole genome analysis. We do whole genome sequencing as well as whole proteome analysis. And this, again, will lead us to functions and mechanisms of what happens in microgravity. And I do think there is actually one more slide at the end. And that is the mission patch for CSO2. Um, my brother's actually an artist, so he designed it. And it has, since we uh, started with the mouse, and we have the cell, the osteoblast, and the DNA, because her group's doing a lot of the omics. And um, we were also told by NASA that you have uh, the seven stars for the seven astronauts that fell. And so it was actually a great experience so far. And we hope for a successful launch and a uh, successful payload. Any do we have questions for our doctors? Anybody who broke a bone who wanted to know how, how this will, would have helped? All right, let's thank our doctor thank one more time. So for the past 18 years, a lot of medical research has been conducted in low Earth orbit on the International Space Station. This next project is very important to patients suffering from Parkinson's disease and multiple sclerosis. Let's welcome Dr. Andres Bratliel, Principal Investigator from Aspen Neuroscience, and Dr. Valentina Fassati, Principal Investigator from New York Stem Cell Foundation Research Institute. Thank you, and thank you for this great opportunity.
We are excited to share our study uh, today with you. And this is a, really a coast-to-coast -coast collaboration that was made possible uh, by the vision of uh, Paul, um, Paula Grisanti, the CEO of the National Stem Cell Foundation, who brought together our laboratory, the New York Stem Cell Foundation Research Institute that is based in New York City, and the laboratory of Jean Loring and Andres Bratlil, based in San Diego, at Summit for Stem Cell Aspen Neuroscience. And we have been partnering with Space Tango, that is in Kentucky, uh, that uh, developed and built the hardware and is going to operate from ground. So what do we usually do in our lab on Earth? Can we have the next, the first slide, please? Uh, this is, uh, we, uh, we are both interested in studying neurodegenerative diseases. I, I have particular interest in uh, multiple sclerosis and Andres Bradlil in Parkinson's disease. And those that you can see here are actual brain cells from two patients. So how did we do that? Uh, we certainly did not ask the patients to uh, open their brain and give us some cells. Nobody would do that, right? But these patients are still alive. So we are taking advantage of a groundbreaking discovery uh, that was made almost a decade ago, which is the induced pluripotent stem cell technologies. So basically uh, what means is uh, that we are now able to make in a laboratory uh, stem cells uh, starting from a little, few, a little drop of blood from any of us or a little tiny piece of skin. And we convert these cells into what we call induced pluripotent stem cells. And that can be expanded and frozen and kept in the lab, uh, but we use them to generate any cell type that we want. So in our case that we are studying neurodegenerative diseases, we really want to make the brain cells and study them. So next slide, please. These are actually the cells that came a couple of days ago before we are launching them, and they are ready to go. Uh, and what is it? This is a three-dimensional culture. It's a kind of a, a spheroid, a sphere containing different cell types in the brain. Next slide, please. Those are the neurons uh, on your, uh, um, you can see them on your right. You, you are all very familiar with neurons, but maybe many of you are not that much familiar with other cell types that we have in the brain. They're actually, the majority of the brain, 60% about, is made of what we call glia. And glia include different types, uh, uh, which, uh, which is part of it, it's uh, microglia. Uh, microglia are these beautiful cells that you see on the left uh, that have these uh, tiny uh, processes. And next slide, please. We can possibly see a video of them uh, moving their processes around constantly. They are scanning the microenvironment because those are the immune cells that we have in our brain. So they're constantly looking for danger. They're patrolling the brain and seeing you know, if there is any cell death or you know, a viral infection. And as soon as they are activated, they can recruit other cells with the process of neuroinflammation, other cells of the immune system, and they can basically uh, help uh, healing. And these cells are extremely important uh, to keep our brain healthy. But we also realize that they're basically involved in any neurological disease. And we think they play a major role in multiple sclerosis and in Parkinson. And uh, my, uh, our group, and myself, uh, and uh, other, a few other groups, uh, were the, the first about just only two years ago to find a recipe that we could make these stem cells from stem cells. And so we now have the chance, and this is again very, very uh, recent studies, to be able to study the interaction between uh, microglia and neurons. And Andres Platlir will follow telling you how are we gonna do this in microgravity. Thanks, Valentina. So Parkinson's disease and multiple sclerosis are difficult diseases to model in a dish. Um, these are diseases that people typically get when they're older or when they're adults. Um, and, the, and the cells that we get from stem cells are still very young cells. And so the, it's always a difficulty to model these diseases is actually how do you get mature cells from stem cells. Um, and so we're building these more complicated models by including the immune cells of the brain in, inside of these spheroids. Uh, to better model the disease progression of Parkinson's disease and multiple sclerosis by using these complicated mixtures of these two cells. Um, and we know inflammation plays a big role in the progression of these diseases, but we don't really know exactly what is going on and, and what the interplay is between these two cell types. Um, we also know that astronauts in space, there's evidence that their immune systems are affected by time and microgravity. Um, and so we now have a cellular model to be able to study these, these degenerative diseases and also in, in the context of the immune system. We're interested in <clears throat> what the roles of microgravity are on these cells and how we can study these cells together on Earth and also in microgravity to see does gravity change how these cells activate. Um, and so one of the interesting parts is, um, is really how to culture these cells in space. 
And so that was, you know, we, we keep these spheroids separate. If they're together, they, they merge together and it would ruin the experiment. But we also need to be able to feed the cells with, and change their culture medium over time. Um, so we worked with a company called Space Tango, and they have this advanced system to be able to culture cells in, in, this, in this cube lab. So when it goes up in space, the astronauts will take this out and they'll plug it in. So that's all, the only astronaut involvement that is required for this experiment. And inside this cube lab, we'll have two different plates of cells. Uh, we're going to have uh, a cell line of neurons made from a Parkinson's patient, and these will be the dopaminergic neurons. And um, <clears throat> so if you could play the next slide, please. Um, so we'll have a cell line from a Parkinson's patient and also an age match control. And these will be making dopaminergic neurons, and these are the neurons that are lost in Parkinson's disease. And um, we'll also have a cell line of, from multiple sclerosis patient, and these will be making in, made into cortical neurons, and, and microglia will be added to those, and also an age match control. So we're interested to see what happens in space. Can we get more mature maturation of these cells? Can we make a better model for Parkinson's disease and multiple sclerosis? Um, can we understand something more about the mechanism of disease progression and, and how uh, gravity um, and, and the forces on these cells affect the way that the immune cells of, of the central nervous system can react. Uh, so I think it has a lot of implications for um, the, the health of brain cells uh, of astronauts that spend a lot of time in space. And we're also hoping to learn more about these two diseases to have new mechanisms and new insights on how we can treat patients. Thank you. Okay, do we have any questions about this? Anyone? All right, well, let's thank our doctors. So NASA has long led the way in setting international standards for space travel. When we go forward to the moon and on to Mars, we will be going with other countries and commercial partners. So we will go together. To talk about one of these international standards, the docking adapter, let's welcome Jason August, NASA docking systems project manager. Jason's going to tell us what's in Dragon's trunk. Good morning. Thank you very much. Uh, my name is Jason August, and I am the current project manager for the International Docking Adapter at Na NASA's Johnson Space Center. I'm going to tell you a little bit about the IDA today. Uh, we have a model here of the IDA, and I have a nice picture to show you also of uh, the IDA being hoisted into Dragon's trunk. This was taken just a couple of weeks ago. Here you're looking at the bottom side of the International Docking Adapter. Um, before I get too far into what we're going to be doing with this particular international docking adapter, what I'm going to do is I'm going to give you a little bit of background about uh, why we need an international docking adapter and why is it called international docking adapter. So uh, the reason we need this docking adapter is currently on board we have one IDA, this will be our second IDA, but uh, that that second port is still outfitted with what we call an APAS, or an androgynous peripheral assembly system. That is the docking system that we used for the shuttle. It was designed specifically for the mass pairings of a giant shuttle in the ISS. And we needed something that's a little more versatile, and we wanted something that fits the international docking system standard. What is the international docking system standard? Well, that is a standard that was developed by NASA in conjunction with all of our international partners. We developed it with ESA, JAXA, our Russian colleagues, and CSA. And we put that together to make sure that we had a standard that all of our developers could use, all international partners and commercial partners could use, so that when we, they were docking in space, we could make sure that all of our vehicles were attaching to the same thing. So, in order to do that, we enlisted the help of our prime contractor, Boeing, and they worked with Energia to get the primary structure for the IDA. Um, the reason we did that is because the APAS mechanism, the shuttle docking mechanism, was originally designed by a Russian contractor. So we were converting that into something that would fit the uh, international docking system standard. Now, what this international docking adapter does for us is it provides a passive interface on the International Space Station. And let me explain to you a little bit about what that means. I'm going to show you a video. At the top of this video, you're going to see something that is standing still. That's going to represent the ISS or the IDA side of the interface. At the bottom, you'll see a visiting vehicle, and it extends out what we call its soft capture system. And that then latches on to the IDA. And 
aligns the vehicle, the vehicle will align with the ISS. It will retract that soft capture system. And then once it's fully retracted, that visiting vehicle will drive its hooks and will fully mate to the ISS or the International Docking Adapter. So now that we know a little bit about how docking works, I'd like to explain to you what we're going to do with IDA3 in particular. So I have another graphic I can show you. In this graphic, you'll see the, the space station, the, the US segment. At the very top of that, you can th see IDA3 is highlighted. That's where we're going to put this docking adapter. It goes on the node 2 Zenith port. As I mentioned earlier, this will be our second docking adapter. Uh, the first was installed on node 2 forward, IDA2. Uh, both of these are installed to what we call pressurized mating adapters. And then you can see at the bottom of the picture, Dragon is birthed to node 2 nadir. And that's where we'll be getting the IDA out of the trunk of Dragon. And I've highlighted our other birthing port at node 1 nadir. So once we have IDA3 installed, we will have two docking ports and two berthing ports on board the ISS. And what I'd like to do now is I'd like to show you a video of the robotic operations that are required to extract this IDA out of the trunk. Here you can see it being pulled out of the trunk. The SSRMS, which is the robotic arm, uh, will maneuver around to take the IDA between the GEM module and the PMM. Once it gets to the top of the station, it will maneuver above the pressurized mating adapter, and it will slowly lower it down into place on the PMA, the pressurized mating adapter, where we will mate the IDA to the PMA. What's not shown in that video is what we'll actually do in order to mate We'll do a spacewalk. We'll have crew members go out there, connect some cables to the docking adapter that will allow us data and power insight so that we can drive the hooks on the IDA to interface with that APAS shuttle docking system adapter. And uh, once that's done, the crew members will then reconfigure those cables on the IDA so that we can operate the other side of the docking mechanism. And then we'll be ready for future visiting vehicles. Uh, we are very excited about getting IDA3 on board. As Pete mentioned earlier, this is critical in our path to allowing our commercial partners to ferry crew members to and from the ISS. In addition, we're going to have future cargo vehicles that dock to the ISS as well. So we need two docking ports. It's critical in order to meet all of our objectives and to continue on our path to commercializing low, low Earth orbit. Um, additionally, uh, this docking technology is, is great because it gives us an opportunity to test out our technologies for our future development for our Lunar Gateway program, our Orion program, and any other programs that come down the road. So with that, I'll uh, turn it over if anybody has any questions. All right, we have one here in the back. I, uh, I had a question about your uh, graphic that you showed where the robotic arm was pulling the items out of the dragon. Are those movements pre-programmed before you go up there, or does somebody actually control each of those? Uh, we will actually have flight controllers um, in Houston and up at CSA that will help drive the robotic arm. Um, we do choreograph all of those ahead of time. But we have flight controllers that actually command those, those movements of the arm. OK. There's a question here in the front row. Just wait for the microphone. Um, just to clarify, is the docking process automated when a vehicle connects to the new dock? Uh, so the docking systems can vary depending on what visiting vehicle um, is operating that docking system. So they, they are unique. As long as they follow the, the standard, then they will be able to mate to the IDA. So. Um, depending on the vehicle, some are more automated than others. But in general, we are going towards more automation. And for the most part, a lot of the docking sequence is automated. OK, anyone else? Yes, we have up yeah, here. Yeah, um, <laughs> when, when the arm moves like that, how much power does it actually take from the whole space station in general? Like what percent? Or is it just not even considered that it's a big deal? Or it is a big deal? It, it, we, we use the robotic arm frequently on board the space station. Um, I, 
unfortunately, I'm not sure exactly how much power it takes, but, but we've allocated enough power to pretty much always be able to use the arm when we need to be able to use it. And we're able to do that without, um, without taking away from the power we need to do critical science and other objectives on board the station as well. Okay, I think we had another question up here in front. Hey there, can you talk a little bit about the governing body for standards in space and what the process would look like for developing new standards or iterating on existing standards? Yeah, so the, we kind of are forging a new pathway here. Um, this is one of the first uh, international standards for space systems that, that we've put together. And uh, NASA sort of led the charge on this one, but uh, we, we brought a whole group of people together to, to work on this standard specifically, and we, we made sure that we were involving all of our partners. So there's not one particular way to, to forge forward on developing a standard. Um, we we kind of forged a new path with this one, and hopefully we learned a lot of lessons, and we can use those for, for the development of future standards as well. Okay, anyone else have a question for Jason? I think we have someone along the wall. Hello, yes, thank you for the time. I was just wondering, given the importance of the IDA, do you know or think there will ever be plans to add maybe a third or fourth? Uh, that's a good question. Um, at the moment, we don't have any plans to add another IDA to the space station. However, as was mentioned previously, we are engaging commercial partners to add commercial elements, and we fully encourage those, uh, those that are participating in that effort um, to consider things like docking ports in the future, and they may, they may choose to add something similar. So I would say it's not necessarily off of the table. Okay, anyone else? All right, Jason, thank you very much. So we told you a lot about what's on board CRS-18. And you can find more information on these projects and many others at nasa.gov slash ISS dash science. You can also follow them on Twitter at ISS underscore research. And for those who would like an update on the launch, go to nasa.gov slash SpaceX. Let's thank our speakers one more time with a round of applause. I'd also like to thank our NASA social participants who served as our audience today. We hope that you will share some of this great research with your followers, as well as the exciting things you're gonna see at Kennedy Space Center during your tour. But next, Let's go get ready for launch. <laughs>